Before we begin, I would like to remind all attendees to observe some house rules, as this will be a live session and that there are notable individuals who will be in the call. Please be mindful of your microphone and mute yourselves at all times, and please turn on your camera for the duration of the event. I also invite everyone in this call to provide their reactions throughout the call that can be found at the bottoms of their screens. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon I bid to the Right Honourable Tan Sri Datuk Sri Panglima Richard Malanjum, former Chief Justice of Malaysia, Datuk Brandon Keith Soh, Trustee for WWF Malaysia, Professor Farid Sufian Shuaib, Dean of the Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws on behalf of Prof Emeritus Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Rector of the International Islamic University Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr Maizatun Mustafa, Academician Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws, International Islamic University, Malaysia, Madam Mizan Muhammad, Director of IIM World Debate and Oratory Centre, IWAN, CEO Sophia Lim, 
and Conservation Director Henry Chan of WWF Malaysia, Mr. Roger Chin, representative from Sabah Law Society, representatives from the International Islamic University, representatives from the Sabah Law Society, representatives from the Malaysian Centre for Constitutionalism and Human Rights, MCCHR, participants of the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition, NMTC 2021, and to all viewers watching live, welcome to the launching of the inaugural National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition 2021. My name is Muhammad Ilham Hafiz bin Azmi, and I will be your MC for today's event. First of all, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the VIPs, speakers, and participants from various varsities throughout the country for making time to attend the soft launch for the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition and MD1. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, for the, for the inaugural NMTC, there will be 10 teams from eight different universities competing to become the first ever NMTC champion. The teams are International Islamic University Malaysia IIUM, Mara University of Technology UITM 1 and 2, Taylor's University 1 and 2, Multimedia University MMU, University Malaysia Sabah UMS, University Sultan Zainal Abidin Uniza, University Science Islam Malaysia USIM, and Advanced Tertiary College ATC. Please give the participating teams a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, our launch this evening will be split into three segments. The first would be a short forum, second, the launch, and third, the release of the matchups and the case scenario for the first round of NMTC. Without further ado, I shall pass the floor to our moderator for the first segment, the short forum, Brother Ashraf Hakimi. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ilham Hafiz. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good afternoon, I bid to our esteemed speakers, respected VIPs, representative from the organizers and collaborators, the participants of MTC 2021, and all of our viewers at live stream on Facebook and also YouTube. Welcome to today's forum organized in conjunction with the launching of the inaugural National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition 2021. I'm Ashraf Hakimi, and I will be the moderator of this forum. Alhamdulillah, we are honored to have with us two esteemed speakers with long years of experience and knowledge under their wings with us today. Deeply appreciate the time that they have taken out of their busy schedules to be with us this evening. Each speaker will be spending 15 minutes talking about recent and important developments relating to unsustainable developments. Ladies and gentlemen, unsustainable issues are the phenomena including global warming, destruction of ozone shield, acidification of land and water, desertification and soil loss, deforestation and forest decline, diminishing productivity of land and waters, and extinction of species and population. UN report that since 2015, over 2 billion people live in countries experience high water stress. Natural disasters, natural disasters such as floods has affected 2.3 billion people, killing 157,000 more and causing 662 billion US dollar in damage. Since 2019, land degradation, declining soil fertility, unsustainable water use, overfishing and marine environment degradation are all lessening the ability of natural resource base to supply food. And at the end, currently, there are more than 38 million children under the age of five who are considered living in unhealthy condition. All this refer to the same problem, unsustainability to save nature and the future. So in this forum, we have two prominent speakers who will deliver inspirational speeches for the youth 
and students on the issues of unsustainable development. And also for participants, please take note that you are allowed to ask questions to our speakers at the end of the session. Now, moving on to our first speaker. He is a well-known expert in the legal and judicial fraternity. He is none other than the Right Honourable, Honourable Tan Sri Datuk Sri Panglima Richard Malanjong. His lordship is a Malaysian jurist and lawyer who served as the ninth Chief Justice of Malaysia and also fought Chief Justice of Sabah and Sarawak. His lordship had earned a distinction of being the first native of Sabah to be elevated to the post of a judge of the High Court and also the first Sabahan to be elevated as the judge of the Court of Appeal and the Federal Court. And also during that time, he has also become one of the youngest judges in the history of Malaysian judiciary to be appointed to that position at the age of 52 years old in 2018. It is such a to have him with us today. Since before entering the judicial series, his lordship was the president of the Sabah Law Association, one of the organizers of NMTC 2021. Among the hardships to now landmark cases decided by his lordship during his tenure in the judiciary are the case of Lina Joy in 2007, the case of Harold Allah in 2014, the case of Indra Gai in 2000, and also the Almanuto Athens case in 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, with the undue delay, I shall now pass the floor to Tan Sri, Datuk Sri Panglima, Richard Manjung. Thank you. Ashraf, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I don't deserve a long one, but uh, thank you. Nevertheless, uh, <coughs> good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I should start with uh, the long list of uh, salutation, yeah, I think, uh, to Brendan So, trustee of the WWF Malaysia, uh, Dean of Ahmad Kulia, Ahmad uh, Ibrahim Kulia, uh, Law Faculty, Dr. Farid Su uh, Sofian Suaib, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mai Zatun Mustafa, <clears throat> environmental law lecturer of the um, uh, Madam Mizan Muhammad, director of IAUM World Debate and Oratory Center, uh, the CEO Sophia Lim and conservation director Henry Chan of the WFF Malaysia, <clears throat> representative of the International Islamic University of Malaysia, uh, representative of the Sabalo Society, representatives of the Malaysian Center for Constitutional Law and Human Rights, Participant of the National Diversity Mock Trial uh, 2021, and all viewers watching live on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, uh, I must say thank you very much to the organizers and especially to uh, the law school of uh, <coughs> um, uh, Ahmad, uh, Professor Ahmad Ibrahim. Hello, I'll invite me to do a short address this afternoon. So <clears throat> what I propose to do is uh, I'll share you all a short screen so easier for you to understand, just in case I cannot be heard, yeah? So I will uh, start with uh, this, uh, okay. Uh, I hope that you all can see this, yeah? Uh, let me start with this, okay. Uh, everybody can see? I hope so, okay. <clears throat> and uh, this afternoon, yeah, I'm going to speak on uh, the topic uh, sustainable uh, <clears throat> infrastructure for sustainable development, attaining environmental justice. Uh, these topics, ladies and gentlemen, seem to be contradictory or paradoxical, I would say. The key words are sustainable, environmental, and justice. Maybe to attain environmental justice this equation might be the answer. Yeah? Sustainable infrastructure plus sustainable development and the over balancing process, you get environmental justice. 
Uh, I don't know whether this equation will work or not, but you can try it. So the denominator is the balancing process. Hence, when there is an infrastructure project proposed, it should be balanced based on the needs of the environment. <clears throat> the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice yeah, as, uh, fair as the fair treatment and uh, meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Now that is the US definition of environmental justice. In other words, uh, environmental laws, regulations, and policies must be applied and implemented fairly and effectively by all enforcement agencies on all levels of society without any form of discrimination. That the state interest should not simply be given priority regardless of individual interest. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> hang on. Huh? The question is, is our world community, our own country, our own state heading towards that direction? My brief answer is this. There is the spirit is willing but the flesh is too weak. We can recall how quick Trump, uh, President Trump, pulled out of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change just because such an arrangement may not have been initial to USA. Now, the main obstacle, in my view, in attaining environmental justice is that our society today, especially in the developing world, is that it is not so much as not having the laws and regulations but the inadequate awareness of those in the position of governing and powers in the importance of protecting the environment, not for today's benefit, but for the generations to come. The common policy approach to economic development has been to concentrate on getting rich first and hope to have resources to fix the environmental letter. That is, the grow now, clean up later mindset. There is also too much narratives of development, modernity, and progress used both to legitimize private grants and unequal decision taken as developing, country, developing countries. And this has been said by <coughs> Dr. Lee Keng Po in his uh, thesis paper. Uh, just look at our education system. Leave alone, yeah, the primary and secondary school. Our tertiary <clears throat> education is no better. Environmental law subject is optional, as though it is one of the least in importance. There is too much emphasis on let me deal with the existing problems and let the future problems be tackled by others. So long as our leaders be they in the political, economic, or social sphere, chant this mantra, it is very unlikely, unlikely eh, that we can ever achieve to a reasonable standard of environmental justice, ladies and gentlemen. The sad reality is this. We humans, supposed to be thinking, uh, the thinking species eh, in the animal kingdom, never learn to think proactively we love to blame others when problems come to us and denying that we contributed to those problems by our past action or add in actions. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, nature preservation as opposed to physical infrastructure development meant for the betterment of human beings has always been a controversial issue from time immemorial. Maybe that is the very reason for the great religions of the world invariably make references on the need to protect the environment. Dalai Lama eh, uh, said this, our ancestors viewed the earth as rich and bountiful, which it is. Many people in the past also saw nature as inexhaustibly sustainable, which we now know is the case only if we care for it. 
close cooperations. In May 2019, the Interfaith World Environment Day celebration in Nairobi, Kenya, organized by the United Religions Initiative Africa and the All African Conference of Churches in collaboration with the UN Environment. Mr. Gary Lewis, the Director of Policy and Program Division at the UN Environment said this, and I quote, without air, there is no life and polluted air has become an invisible killer. Annually, about 7 million people die as a direct result of poor air quality. We need to act and communicate about the environmental challenges we face and how we can fix them to meet our sustainable development goals, close quote. Well said, but do we care that human needs may override nature while at the same time, human greed must be kept in check. In the past, ladies and gentlemen, the need to resolve this paradox huh, was not as critical as today, simply because the supply outweighed the demand, resources in plenty, and human greed was then endemic. But today, the situation has tremendously changed. Supply has shrunk, while human greed has become pandemic, as bad as COVID-19, I think, added by the fact that humans have learned to live longer in this planet, hence the population boom. Did not Mahatma Gandhi say this? Earth provide us, provide enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greed. We have taken the liberty to forget that wisdom. Limited resources as against high demand result in over-exploitation. The result is not only our natural resources depleted, but our waste or treasures have multiplied so much that we do not know where to dump them. The West are exporting their treasures of plastic and computer parts to the African continent and Southeast Asia, including Malaysia. That is where the major problem lies upon our environmental environment today. Let me go local first, yeah, before going into some other national international challenges facing our environmental environment today. In Sabah, these are the current burning issues. One, should a dam be built for water supply to the urbanites and inundated villages, inundated villages of the indigenous. And here we can come and bring to mind yeah, the proposed Papar Dam or Kaiduan Dam, they said. Should a highway be built to cut through forests of the homes of the wild animals? Think of the ongoing Pan Borneo highways going through the forest reserve in the east coast of Sabah in order to save coast. And in the recent, recent, recent big floods yeah, in the Pinapang and uh, Papar areas, many are pointing fingers on the poor drainage being constructed to ensure smooth flow of in, uh, in the areas traversed by the highway. Now, should areas of mangrove trees be reclaimed to make way for prone culture project? We think this, we remember this in the Marudu Bay in Sabah, where they literally reclaim a big chunk of the bay where the mangroves are and uh, started a prone culture only to fail. The consequence was that the indigenous day suffered as well. They lost their habitat, literally. Should more forest areas be cleared to make way for oil palm plantation and oil mills so that more revenues can be generated for the state thus and more development to improve the quality of human lives? These are problems here, especially clearing the forest and replanting with oil palm and the consequences are very sad. The is a village in Paitan. The Paitan villages are suffering, especially in Matangal, the Kampung Matangal. They have no water supply for years, and they had actually one time a mighty river, now badly polluted. No fish for protein supply. And water depends on the mountain gravity system. Lucky for them, yeah, that the Environmental Committee of the Court in Sabah and Sarawak managed to organize a project for them by getting materials uh, to build the gravity system. Now, the same committee actually implemented a policy, what, what they call it the One Million Tree Planting Program. Now, while several government departments yeah, participated in the program, it did not gain much traction. 
uh, it did not go much of statewide simply because I think there was no uh, determination from those uh, in power. Now, <clears throat> of course, Sabah gave way uh, under the FMU program, the Forest Management Unit, big acres of land, in fact, millions, I think, to companies hoping that this would plant trees, yeah, and, uh, and thus uh, reforest the state. So far, there's not much reporting on the success of this program, perhaps not much planting, but more on the logging. Since in January this year, the chief minister declared that in five years' time, Sabah hoped to plant 36,000, uh, 36 million, I think, uh, uh, 36,000 under 100 million tree planting campaign. And that's the thing. Uh, we are wet for, in a bad fear, a better uh, breath, huh? on the success of this much touted program. But one question I'm wondering, we have the MFU, F, uh, FMU program in place. Why is it that there's a need for us to start replanting trees again? Surely all those companies given the area should be replanting. That is a big question mark. And only quite recently, uh, we also read in the media that uh, some state in Peninsula are also trying to organize a tree planting. Hopefully this time, uh, such a program can go into a national, uh, uh, and becomes a national program. Now we need infrastructure development, ladies and gentlemen, but they must not be at the expense of the environment. What is the point of having mega projects while we destroy the environment, including the minorities living in affected areas? Take for instance, the Bakun Dam. <clears throat> When it was started as a, as a project, a development, uh, it will, they said it will satisfy the hunger, the energy hunger of Malaysia and even Brunei. Today, Sarawak is still building more dams. I don't know for what. And what went wrong? Uh, yet the price paid by the indigenous in the Bakun area, uh, which area is as big as Singapore, is, 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 is tremendous. They are now living in a settlement. They call it Kampung Asap Resettlement. I've been there. I saw them. And uh, <clears throat> when you are resettled, being indigenous, you, your way of life is literally gone. You are no longer familiar with your new habitat and so forth. So <clears throat> the question now is, was there a fair application of the environmental laws and regulation upon them? those in the Bakun area. Was the Bakun Dam a sustainable infrastructure for sustainable development? How is the cost-benefit look upon a close and fair scrutiny being conducted? The indigenous went to court to plead their case. The High Court saw the flaws in the application of the laws. And that, this, <coughs> that this which sets of law or the environmental impact assessment should be applied the federal or the state rules or rule in favor of the indigenous. The Court of Appeal overturned the High Court judgment, preferring to interpret the laws that was more, for, more favorable for the continuation of the project. Now, I ask, is that a hallmark of environmental justice? And whatever happened to the Lioness issue? Never ending saga. Why should Malaysia be the dumping ground of toxic materials? Are the benefits owing the risk to human life in nearby areas? We had successfully challenged Bukit Mera, the same thing, earth, uh, rare earth processing, and the Broga, of course, incinerator project. But though, sadly, uh, it did not go through the courts, you know, but more because of the public opinion that swung the, 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 the project away from us. Now, <clears throat> Uh, I don't know whether we, Le, Linus will ever go, succeed in court or in the end it may have to depend again on public opinion, national and international. In Malaysia, we have also touted the Article 5 and Article 8 of the Federal Constitution safeguarding the, uh, the rights uh, to invite clean environment. And of course, that was the case in Tantak Seng. Uh, that was proclaimed. The Court of Appeal say that the expression life appearing in Article 5.1, the 
does not refer to mere existence but includes the right to live free, reasonably healthy, and polyaroman. And in Bato Bagi case, to say that it is therefore not unheard that the government ought to protect the interests of the natives, the natives, yeah. This jury pronouncement it is for now. Hence, the need to ingrain them into our common law. <coughs> it's my turn. But maybe a longer, little longer, as our local jurisprudence is yet to evolve uh, onto the issue on the issue of local standai. While the Philippines and the Indonesia yeah, courts are moving ahead on this issue, we are stuck to a 1988 legal principle with an attempt to unlock it still in gestation. In the Philippines, for instance, ladies and gentlemen, even the dolphins have standing in court. While in Indonesia, a few days ago, a week ago, the judges of the civil for the civil law suit eh, at the Central Jakarta, uh, Jakarta District Court ordered the president, you know, to tighten the national air quality standard to protect the health of humans, the environment, and ecosystem, including the health of the sensitive population because an action was started by the Jakarta Legal Aid Foundation. So you see these two countries seem to be moving ahead of us in Malaysia. And we are still, as I said, very much stuck to an all idea of locus standai. In India, of course, uh, environmental is a big issue. Uh, environment is a big issue. It has become a common law of that country that the right to enjoy pollution-free uh, pollution water and air is part of environmental right enshrined in the constitution to the extent that the right to life includes the right to life with human dignity, which encompasses protection and preservation of environment, ecological balance, free from pollution of air, water and water and sanitation. And this you can find in cases called Shubhas Kumar and of course in Virendra. Anyway, Malaysia is not alone, ladies and gentlemen, in the construction of infrastructure at the expense of the indigenous. In the state of, in Brazil, yeah, in the state of Rondonia, the dam built for the Girau hydroelectricity plant has changed the flow of the Madeira River, one of the Amazon largest tributaries, displacing indigenous groups and increasing flood risk. The authorities went to the extent of removing the designation protecting uh, communities and habitats. This is another indication of the discriminatory application of the environmental law at the expense of the vulnerable minorities. The environmental justice has been clearly denied to these affected parties. So what is the civil society supposed to do? In Malaysia, it would be good if there is a concerted effort by the various NGOs to persuade the relevant authorities to legislate so that the scope of local standard, at least in respect on environmental cases, can be more encompassing. If this issue is resolved, it will be easier to judicial intervention to monitor and compel the authorities to implement the various environmental legislation fairly and effectively free of any influence from parties with vested interests. Environmental legislation may need to be amended to ensure discretionary powers to enforcement authorities are limited and reviewable. In addition, development activities by the governmental authorities should not be exempted from the application of environmental laws, such as the EIA requirements. Transparency in the processing of application for major development should be practiced with views of the public being invited before any approval is given. Too often, ladies and gentlemen, by the time the public comes to know of the proposed project, all approvals have been given and work about to begin. <clears throat> anyway, it's important that those in power and in the position to approve infrastructure project should always remember that sustainable development only encompasses such development that meets the need of the current generation without compromising the ability, the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. If this is kept in mind and free from any consideration that the more infrastructure development are implemented, the more financial gain can be made 
corrupt money that is in environmental justice will cease to be a mere rage. Uh, so that's what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to Tansil mm -hmm. Richard Malanjung for a very delightful keynote speech. As a law student, I believe there are a few points that are very important to be noted for us as future legal practitioners. In his speech, I was interested when his lordship mentioned that in his view, in attaining environmental justice, is that in our society today, especially in the developing countries, is that it is not so much about the laws and regulation, but rather the inadequate awareness of those in the position of the governance and powers of the importance of protecting the environment, not for today's benefits, but for the generations to come. And this is the reason why, with this spirit, we conduct the NMTC 2021 to create and spread the awareness amongst the university students because they are the future leaders. We would like to keep question for our time stay to the end of the forum. Thank you. Now, our second speaker is an individual who is well versed in the academic discussion surrounding environmental law in Malaysia. Dr. Maizatun Mustafa is an associate professor with the Legal Practice Department, Ahmad Ibrahim Kuliah of Laws, IIUM. Her areas of expertise are environmental law, climate change, and sustainable development. She is currently leading, the, leading a research grant with Erasmus on climate change law and policy. Dr. Maizatun has authored many articles and books, including a book entitled Environmental Law Malaysia. Her book project on climate change litigation with the National University of Singapore and Yale University has been published by Cambridge University Press. In 2017, she became the trainer for environmental court judges at the Judicial and Legal Training Institute Malaysia, ILKAP, organized by the Asia Development Bank. She was also the trainer on climate change for legal and judicial officers in Malaysia. In 2018, she was appointed by the Chief Judge Sabah and Sarawak as an advisor to the Preparation Committee, Environmental Court Rules, and also in 2020, she was invited by the High Court of Sabah and Sarawak and UNDP as a speaker at the Borneo Colloquium on Environmental Justice in Sabah. And also at the international level, she is an active member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, Academy of Environmental Law, and the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall now pass the floor to the Associate Professor, Dr. Maizatun Binti Mustafa. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator, for the introduction. The Right Honorable Tan Sri, Dr. Sri Panglima Richard Malanjung, former Chief Justice Malaysia. Dr. Brandon So, trustee for the WWF Malaysia, Professor Dr. Farid Sufian, the Dean of the Ahmad Ibrahim Kudia of Law, um, Madam Mizan Muhammad, the Director of IWON, IIUM, uh, CEO Sophia Lim and Conservation Director Henry Chan of WWF, representative from IIUM and all law schools, representatives from the Sabah Law Society, representative from the Malaysia Center for the Constitutionalism and Human Rights uh, participants uh, and viewers. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, can you view my screen, everyone? Yes, I can. Okay, that's great. Well, um, I, I got a lot of inspiration just by listening to the speech of Tantri Yuris Richard just now. Um, I, I adore him actually because he is for me the, the, the key person, you know, from the judiciary um, in fighting for environmental issues. Um, I, I really respect the fact that, you know, he is still very much committed in, in environmental matters and I think we are very honoured to have him here. Okay, um, now, um, my, my um, 
presentation today uh, is relating to uh, laws on sustainable development. So for this presentation, I, I am dividing my topics into two. First, I'm going to discuss on sustainable development and SDG. And then uh, on the second part, I will be discussing on Malaysia legal framework on sustainable development, which is the main uh, theme of my presentation. I believe that uh, since we have many um, students here, I would like to start by discussing about what is sustainable development and what is the SDG uh, from the historical perspective. Um, um, the, the term or the concept or the, or the principle of sustainable development has been introduced a long time ago. Actually, it started, in fact, in the year 1972 when uh, United Nations convened the first ever um, international environmental conference attended by many countries in the world, including Malaysia. Please bear in mind that during that time, Malaysia was considered as a newly independent country together with many other countries. So we were so excited to attend the first ever environmental conference. And it was during that conference that many issues was discussed with regard to the importance of environmental protection at the national level. Uh, the, the aspiration and um, that, 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 that was received by countries, including Malaysia, was very overwhelmed. We came back to our country. We thought that we already knew much better on environmental protection after attending the 1972 conference. But in reality, we have, we, we, we as in most of the countries in the world during that time, we were grappling of what would be the objective, what would be the target of our environmental protection at the national level. So it was then that the United Nations commissioned one particular commission known as the Bradley Commission in order to examine the issue at the local level, national level, and so on. So after five years, this commission produced a report known as the Bradley Report. And this is the first time ever that the term sustainable development has been used and introduced. And uh, the term sustainable development was officially introduced during the United Nations Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. And it provides for the definition of sustainable development. According uh, to um, Rio, sustainable development means development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. Um, so in a way, sustainable development uh, has been incorporated by most countries in the world, in, uh, if not all countries in the world, to be our target in our development plan, in our environmental um, objectives and so on, because sustainable development is actually an approach to foster for economic growth while preserving the quality of the environment for the future generation. So in a way, sustainable development are trying to balance both needs, the economic needs, as well as the environmental needs. Okay. However, there have been some development in relation to sustainable development. In the year 2015, uh, United Nations um, members agreed to adopt okay, a, a new revised sustainable development known as the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal. There are 17 goals altogether, and it is meant to achieve by the year 2030. So uh, actually, Sustainable Development Goal uh, is a universal commitment. It is just a soft law. It is not compulsory, but it is meant to um, require all nations to commit to end poverty, to protect the planet, to ensure that people enjoy peace and prosperity. So, uh, and one of the most important principles under the SDG is no one is left behind in the achievement of the SDG. I will not go into detail on the SDG because we, we need to find out what is the position of uh, sustainable development within, within the law. Okay, um, let's, let's look at the framework on environment and sustainable development. When we talk about legal framework, usually we will refer to the policy, the law, as well as the institution. Just now, I already mentioned to you that sustainable development is introduced as a soft law. Okay, Therefore, when it is introduced as a soft law, in a way, there is no obligation on countries to, in, to introduce one particular law on uh, sustainable development. Um, I, I'm here, perhaps, um, we'll explain to you a bit more on 
on is a policy. What, what does it mean? policy as compared to the law. Usually, I will explain this to a non-legal uh, audience. I believe that all of us are, are, are from a le the legal background would understand the difference already, but for the benefit of, you know, uh, maybe uh, non-legal um, persons, I will tell you the difference. Um, law and policy are two different things. Policy usually is simply a broad statement of intention which provide guidance usually it is uh, it um it is a government document that outline what the government want to do or, or what we want to achieve okay so um what is the connection between policy and law well policy provide the the target for example environmental target that we want to achieve law actually would be one of the tools that can be used in order to achieve the target so there is there is a very close link actually between policy and the law itself changes within the law will be made uh, will be devised in accordance with the intention of the policy if the policy talks a lot on sustainable development we will perhaps find that those strategies within our domestic law. Um, there is also definitely a very direct and clear connection between policy and international law. I mentioned to you just now, for example, the Stockholm Conference, which is an international law. Uh, some of these international environmental principles, uh, which has been propagated at the international level, has been brought into um, into our uh, legal framework and it is embodied within our policy. So we will find out to what extent sustainable development has been embedded within some of our environmental related policies. Now, this is one of the policy that I want to discuss with you. Maybe you are already familiar with this national policy on climate change, Dasa Perubahan Iklim Negara. This policy was introduced, uh, let me remember, I think in the year 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, um, the reason why I'm bringing you this policy because we want to find out whether sustainable development has been included or not within this policy on climate change. Now, uh, let's look at some of the principles uh, provided under the climate change policy. We will see the term sustainable development, the term environment has been applied uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, for example, principle one, principle two, principle three, four, and so on. So at the policy level, at least under the climate change policy, we can already see the elements of sustainable development within the policy. Now, let us go into detail. Um, it, it says, for example, here, the National Policy on Climate Change uh, emphasize on the mitigation and adaptation uh, of climate change to enhance the quality of life for sustainable development. So from this perspective, we can see that our climate change policy um, consider a climate change mitigation and adaptation in, uh, in line with the objective of sustainable development. Okay, let me move on further. Uh, but these are some of the questions that, that uh, we need to discuss further, or, or perhaps students or future mortars. Yeah, perhaps I, I, I do not know what type of question that you are going to get for your mock trial. Uh, maybe questions on sustainable development. So these are among the, the points that maybe you can consider whether our national policy on climate change is uh, still current or already outdated. Yeah, please take, uh, please bear in mind that the latest international convention that we have um, signed which is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change was signed in the year 2015. So it, it seems that our, our policy on climate change is, is a bit backdated in, in that way because I don't think it, it cover elements which is required or provisions of the Paris Agreement which is required, which are required upon us. Okay, is it linked to sustainable development? I gave the answer already. I don't want to go into detail. Perhaps, uh, you know, future, uh, you know, uh, competitors, uh, you have to do your own research on this. 
Um, now, what does it mean by sustainable development in actual practice? Just now, I showed to you the definition of sustainable development provided by the United Nations. But actually, in reality, in practice, sustainable development, the meaning is very thin. It is still debatable even though it looks positive, but the concept is left open for interpretation. Meaning that if you remember just now when Tan Sri Richard Malanjong provided a lot of cases, a lot of scenarios with regard to the environmental issues, this is what actually happened at the policy level. At the, poli at the policy level, even though we have what is meant by sustainable development, but how do we interpret it? What is the interpretation? What does it mean? How do what does it mean by balancing environmental protection and economic development? Have do, do we see that in reality? Okay, um, actually, we cannot be too skeptical. Of course, there are a lot of you know good points. Yeah, a lot of um, what to say um, um, success that we might have achieved. Yeah. Um, however, uh, at the same time, also uh, we have to bear in mind. Uh, we, we perhaps we can look at the the, the, the the current situation of COVID yeah um, now um, the two uh, the, the, the main debate in COVID when we talk about um, right to development right to open up the economy and right to protect public interest health of the public which one comes comes first? It is not easy to make a decision. On our part, we want to protect our health, but on the other hand, there are certain segment, okay, of the society, especially the business sector, that would want you know business to be open right away. Okay, for your information, this morning I presented at one conference known as Business and Human Rights. So a lot of this issue we will discuss about uh, environmental rights within the context of business and business operation in Malaysia uh, at present, which I, I really welcome because previously we never take into consideration, no, business never take into consideration the needs or the importance of environmental rights, environmental protection uh, of the society, for, for example. But um, business and human rights is uh, propagated by one uh, sector of the United Nations, which is the UNDP. So it has been, uh, you know, uh, bring into Malaysia and it, 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 it now becoming, uh, you know, um, at, at this point we are, Okay, the government is trying to introduce national action plans already where elements of the environment will be or need to be included within the, uh, you know, the, the activities, the economic activities or business activities. Now, uh, having said that, okay, uh, even though sustainable development is quite elusive in terms of its principle, but there are certain criteria that we can use and compare, uh, especially within our law. If these criteria are available within our law, it means that our law apply or subscribe to the intention of sustainable development. Um, perhaps you are already familiar with some of these principles, such as precautionary principle, polluted waste principle, public participation, transparency, accountability, no one is left behind, common but uh, differentiated responsibilities. I will not go into detail because I'm not sure whether my time is already up. Moderator, how long do I have? Can you tell me the time? Otherwise, I need to stop soon. Uh, perhaps we have uh, three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. Okay. All right. Now, these are among the environmental related legislations that we have. Okay. Uh, the list is longer, actually. Um, if you notice that some of this law, uh, some of these laws, they were enacted uh, before the introduction, uh, before uh, the, the yeah the, the incorporation of um, national policies such as climate change policies. Okay, so um, within these laws, we are not able to find one term sustainable development, except for. Number thirty two lah, sustain, sustainable energy development. But then again, the the the, the definition uh, of sustainable development under, for example, in uh, legislation number thirty two might be different from the definition of sustainable development within the policy framework that we sh we saw just now. Uh, we cannot find any specific terms of climate change within these 
uh, for example, um, environmental le re related legislations. Okay, having said that, okay, just now when I presented uh, at the business and human rights uh, con conference, conference um, I had a discussion with um, some uh, officers from the Department of Environment and CASA. Um, apparently, we are going to introduce or going to pass more new laws relating to the environment, okay, such as uh, law on climate change. And another one is law on um, transboundary pollution. So, so, um, so this is another thing, okay? We are having more and more numbers of legislations. Um, it, it looks like overwhelm, yeah? Um, for you as an environmental law student, just imagine you have to study all these legislations, yeah? Um, because each and every legislation uh, will focus on different aspects of the environment. On the other hand, is it practicable or not to have one specific comprehensive law on, on, on environment or sustainable development? It might not be practicable uh, because um, on one hand, we have to realize that environmental pollution, it is continuously evolving, I would say. And then it is on the part of the law to catch up. Uh, I have raised this matter uh, during my presentation this morning. I informed them that, you know, previously we don't have um, environmental issues such as um, light pollution or in Malay, uh, pencemaran cahaya. Previously, uh, okay, um, because Malaysia is, is very much developed, we have a lot of cities yeah, in our country for the purpose of survival. We talk about nocturnal animal that need to hunt during the darkness of the night. When the night is no longer dark, we are depriving this type of animal. Okay, um, so this is something that, that, that we need to take into consideration. The point that I'm making here is that the law has always to catch up with new type of environmental issues. And then these environmental issues keep on coming. And what are the reasons? Why do we have so many environmental issues? Okay, who contribute to environmental issues? I would definitely say that among the main contributor would be the economic sector. But at the end of the day, it is us, us a person, yeah, and individual also contribute yeah, in one way or the other. Uh, therefore, it is very important that the elements of sustainable development uh, to be included and applied within the law in order to, 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 to balance this and to balance between the environment and development. I, I want to share okay, one success story. This is quite recent. I think this will be good to, you know, uh, to the, uh, the motors um, to have a look at this case. Um, I have uh, followed this case for several years already. Uh, the NGO there was, at that time, was, they were very concerned about the, the, um, the Penang government uh, reclamation project, which will um, uh, clear some coastal area in Penang, depriving the depriving uh, you know uh, the rights of local community, especially the fishermen. So uh, this report, um, you know, this news where um, the EIA approval of the Penang reclamation project uh, has been revoked is actually a good a good news in the sense that it is now a requirement the court has ordered I think uh, the developer to resubmit the EIA approval and please bear in mind that EIA is actually supposedly to be uh, one of the tools uh, to achieve sustainable development because it, it includes for example uh, elements of public participations element of um, uh, access to information, access to justice, and so on. Of course, to what extent it is being applied, uh, you know, implementation issue, that is another matter that needs to be deliberated. But, but for me, this is a very, what to say, uh, um, uh, groundbreaking case that, that you know, uh, in relation to the development of sustainable development principle okay, in the context of EIA. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I want to discuss these cases. Okay, uh, all right. Um, many of us, many of the audience here, I believe, 
uh, students, not only from IIUM, but from all other universities. I believe that all universities are embracing sustainable development goals now. This is the example of IIUM where we won the Green Gown Award uh, uh, last year uh, because of of our commitment in sustainable development. So this is something I, I personally look upon the, the youth, the youngsters, because I believe that you are the one that, that, that is carrying these sustainable development goals, climate change objective very well. I look up on, on the youth. I, I think that um, I really admire the dedication and the, the drive that youths nowadays have uh, in bringing the environmental issues at the higher level, including to the policy makers. Uh, last, I just want to share with you my write up. Uh, I wrote it two years ago, but I think it is still relevant. Uh, in the newspaper, I wrote about the varsities should champion sustainable development goal. When I spoke about varsity, it is not just a varsity as an institution, but of course, students, university students higher in, in higher learning educations, um, you have a big role to play. We are relying on you. We will be here to support you, but we believe that you are the future. So um, that will be all for me. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum. Thank you much, Dr. Shah Professor Atun. There are a lot of things that we can learn and gain from her insightful speech. It is interesting to not to note of the long list of laws that is available and whether it is practical to have just one act, definitely a point to ponder on. Ladies and gentlemen, we now open the floor for Q&A session. You can key in your question in the chat or you can unmute yourself to verbalize your question. For those who want to ask questions, you may state your name and also the question is for which speaker. After that, you may proceed with your question. Um, I see a question in the chat for Tan Sri Richard Maranjum. Uh, may I just check if Tan Sri is there? Yeah. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, where's the question again? Eh? All right, I, I can read the question. I read the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can read. Um, in Tan Sri's view, do we have enough cases on environmental protection and climate change being filed in court? What is the judicial and legal attitude regarding these cases, particularly the current bench and bar, and where it is a matter of policy? If I'm still on the bench, I can give you the answer quick enough. Lah. But anyway, I've retired, and uh, but I can share with you what actually is the basic problem I think on our environmental cases. First thing is this: eh? mainly environmental cases deals with public interest litigations. Uh, for example, in the Philippines and Indonesia, mostly done by NGOs and so forth. <clears throat> Hardly there'll be a human being doing it, except maybe for the Linus case, uh, where some people were in it, and also in the, in the Broga. In Broga did not come to court, the Bukit Merah case. <clears throat> Otherwise, no. And the big uh, obstacle, of course, is the question of locus and that. And that's why I was saying just now that how I wish this uh, jurisprudence be improved for Malaysia so that we have more NGOs able to take up uh, 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 public interest litigation and uh, fight for cases. You don't expect, you know, the, the, the indigenous uh, to come to court because it's very expensive affair. The only reason I think the Bakun uh, fellows came to court, went to court, is because uh, there were some people helping them out. But otherwise, they would have just accepted it uh, as it is. And this is the problem. So if you ask me then that uh, whether enough cases or not, it's a question of chicken and egg situation. As long as we have problem for assessing yeah, I think to, to court, access to justice is very limited because of local standard. Environmental cases, I think, will be going to be quite of a tough issue to coming to court, for at least for now. So I'm hoping that if that is being relaxed, huh, if the proposed uh, uh, change in the rules of court, there was actually an, um, a proposed amendment to that, but after that, uh, there are a lot of smart, smart Alex around which are not happy with the things and which are put. They already go for technicalities than practicality, you know. 
And uh, how I wish they should read the book by Lord Denning, The Road to Justice, where justice must prevail over the law. But unfortunately, there are people like that who, who stick to the law, technical laws, you know, rather than the, the end result. So they were. So at the moment, really, there are very limited cases. But uh, if we can open that, I think it will be very important. And the time has come. If Indonesia yeah, can do it, if Philippines can do it, uh, let alone India, like India, of course, has been there for years. But if Indonesia and the Philippines, our immediate neighbors, can do all that, what is happening to us? Singapore is okay because they, are, they don't have that much of a problem. But Malaysia definitely have a lot of problems. Even in Thailand, I think they are quite liberal towards this. Uh, but we are having a, we are really stuck on this. And I just hope uh, this will be opened up. The, the judges, of course, <clears throat> you can't really blame them because they are tied up by the president, isn't it? Not? And if they try to be smart, they have to be uh, very creative in that, in, 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 the, in that area. And uh, sometimes judges are not happy to be too creative because they can criticize. criticize. They will then somebody says the judges are supposed to interpret the law not to make law. That is the province of parliament. There you are, you have a problem there as well. So you see, it's a neither here day. So to me, the key is this. If we loosen the definition of local standard, at least for environmental uh, cases, uh, I think there will be a boom in the number of cases coming to court. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tansili. So mm -hmm. the key is local mm -hmm. standard. Mm. All right, so I can see that Miss um, Lavaya Rama is raising her hand. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, good afternoon, Tansri, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Associate Prof. My Zatun and Dr. Brandon. Mm. Um, I have uh, three questions for me. Uh, um, mm. First, is, you know, in, in the context of your excellent presentations, I'm just wondering whether our constitution should be amended to enshrine the right to a clean environment, you know, just clearly stated there. Uh, the, sec uh, the second question is, uh, in the Malaysian context, how can our tigers, elephants, orangutans, and all these other species have the voice like the dolphins that you mentioned mm. in, mm. in the Philippines? Mm. Um, and the third, I guess this is maybe like really an underlying thing. It's how we measure progress, and that seems to also affect the way we interpret our laws and how we we then make judgments, you know, assessments as to what is right, what is wrong. So mm. if we measure progress differently, not just according to growth, material growth, mm. Mm. Uh, but actually toward, you know, shifting to, you know, well-being mm. measurements, maybe it's a little bit dif more difficult because it's more qualitative. But mm. if that's the kind of shift that happens, then would that help us move, you know, the, the, the jurisprudence also more effectively, apart from, of course, the very important point you raised, Tansri, on the local standard. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're asking me? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, well, okay, uh, uh, Prof, you want to start first? Uh, Dr. Mazitun, you want to start first? Uh, um, actually, I want to hear your answer, Tansri. I think it's good <laughs> for you. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. On the first question, whether we should amend the constitution, my simple answer to, the, to, uh, to that question is this. We have already provided that. If you look at the constitution of India, it's the same as ours, but the Indian courts have expanded it, and we have actually expanded ours. And that is, of course, in that and a few other cases. We've expanded ours. So it's now a question of implementing it, is it not? Uh, getting real to it. Uh, and it has to be tested through cases. And as I say again, I have to repeat this. Uh, if somebody can come to court and have it tested, especially local standard, if that is being relaxed, I think we can see the development of the law in a better way. Eh? And of course, I agree with you, you know, that uh, there's no point to have very developed countries when uh, your environment is, uh, is useless. And why do you think, I think, the country in Scandinavia even in the US and so forth, they're asking us to preserve our greens because they have no more uh, green lung in, I think, in their countries. They have slaughtered all the trees. So they're asking us to, 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 to stop ours so that 
there is a green lung for the world. Good. And the promises of carbon footprint, is it not? I don't know. Some people told me that they have never fulfilled that promise of carbon uh, footprint payment and all that. Uh, the last time I attended a conference organized by uh, ADB, and uh, they seem that is still an issue. Promise is one thing, but remain promises. So how do you expect a developing country therefore to believe if that is the case? So it has, as uh, <laughs> Dr. Mazatun says, it must be a uh, global community that uh, have to, to address this problem. You know? If you leave it to the individual country, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. And uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, how Philippines, how Indonesia are doing it, it's really quite interesting. Considering that Indonesia gives us a lot of smoke uh, <laughs> every year, but they're still quite active in, in the environment. I don't know. Uh, the transborder thing proposed by Singapore has not been adopted in Indonesia. Neither have Malaysia has adopted it, except Singapore. And uh, it's a very interesting law. But uh, so far, not much of a development. We really have to sit down and work on it. And to, to 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 for the progress of that, you know, if 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 we were to address this issue, no point. As I say, no point to have a uh, adopt that mindset. I said just now, you know, grow first, uh, deal with the problem later. I think if we take that uh, road, uh, we end up in disaster. I think really, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Mazatun, what's your view? <laughs> well. Uh... To, to amend the constitution um, would solve a lot of problems, but whether it is possible to amend it, uh, especially when uh, matters such as forest come under the state list, it would be a bit difficult. Uh, we can, uh, there, there's two ways about it. Um, first is to have uh, one specific provision under our constitution, which recognize human rights, which is similar to countries such as India. On the other hand, perhaps yeah, Tansri, we need a more active uh, interpretation mm. by the bench, by the environmental court mm. in interpreting, for example, Article Three or Article whichever provisions in the Constitution to to uh, include um, uh, you know um, environmental rights, rights to clean air, rights to clean water, and so on. It, it is possible. We have seen some cases already. But we don't. We need to see much more. Okay, that, that is one. And I, I totally agree with uh, Miss Lavanya uh, about the needs to to uh, recognize. Uh, once we have such a okay, we have a long way to go. Uh, yes, I agree. Um, the Philippine, you know, has moved much much far ahead of us, whereby dolphin is given recognition. Uh, I've been to Asia several times, and used to how environmental uh, commitment that they have is actually bottom up. It comes from the society and not the other way around. Malaysia again, we are a bit like, how do I say it? We just follow whatever the government say, we just follow. We don't take mm -hmm. initiative. It's just, we, we rely on government, regardless of whichever government, I tell you, we put the trust on the government to lead us. That, that's how the mentality, we, 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 we take it so easy as compared to the Indonesian, where in fact they still apply and implement their um, adat resam in relation to, you know, a customary law on, on mm. river protection and so on. Mm. So we, we don't have that culture. But maybe in Sabah and Sarawak, I believe that uh, because of the advance in uh, customary law, we would see that for Sabah and Sarawak, but in Semenanjung, I, I, I don't see that. And I feel very embarrassed whenever I visited Indonesia and look at how uh, their, their traditional kampong, uh, how they look after the environment, they take care after their river, they mm. do it themselves. Okay, so uh, that, that, is, that is one thing. And um, what was the question? Yes, and another issue raised by uh, Ms. Lavanya uh, in relation to uh, our policy. Uh, how do I say it? whether the policy, whether sustainable development has failed us or not. Um, I, I, I am doing several research with several projects. 
one of my research project is to look at environmental policy and law from a totally different perspective, from a spiritual and religious perspective, especially from, uh, in Arabic, we call it Makasid Sharia. Maybe some of you have heard of it, the principle of Sharia. Uh, we have a lot of elements uh, because, you know, the society, uh, especially the, the Muslim society are very much uh, endeared to all this Islamic teaching. And I believe that Islamic teaching can actually be used in order to impose obligations, rights, and responsibilities. And not only for the Muslim community, um, we, I, I think in all other religions, uh, especially uh, including Christianity, for example, yeah, uh, Nasri Richard, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are teachings on, on environmental ethics that need to be incorporated at the high level, at the policy level. Okay, this is, something that we have to take it seriously. Uh, if we have, if, if we believe that religion is something that, you know, can, uh, can guide us, definitely teachings in whatever religion on environment, environmental ethics need to be used. So it's must start from education. I would suggest, I would think that it must start from the primary school, yeah, where the, the, the spiritual aspect of environmental protection need to be included. Okay, that's my thought, thank you. Thank you so much. I back to Tansri and also Dr. Maizatun. Um, I think there is also one last question um, from Roger Chin from Sabah Law Society. Tansri, what happened to the Tun Arifin's proposal for rules of court for environmental cases? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I was trying to allude to just now, just now during my speech. What happened was this. I was chairman of that rules committee, you know, I had that special task force. Uh, committee and we form one, we drafted, we sent it to all the, even to the eminent person, like I think uh, uh, Dr. Majatun, I think I have seen the rule draft and all are being approved by 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 the, the the experts of the environmental law, you know, in uh, uh, higher institutions and uh, NGOs. Uh, we circulated there with the Bar Council and so forth. So we got it actually drafted and we took the the Philippines uh, draft uh, uh, set of rules uh, as the guide, and we put that in, and it was actually approved during the main uh, committee, rules committee. I was told it has been approved. By the time everything was finalized, I left. So the present CJ to the Maimon, uh, took over, and I understand that uh, it has been approved by the rules committee. So of course, as usual, the system in Malaysia is after being done, you are nobody, you still have to go through some more kids in the chambers, actually doing the drafting, perhaps. That's the problem. So it was sent to the drafting section. I don't know who read those rules there. And they came back and uh, told us, uh, told the community apparently that all those things are rubbish, that it cannot be done, substantive law, whatever law. They, they, they obviously, they, they didn't want. So I think the last I heard was still stuck there, or maybe it has been forgotten, I'm not sure. But uh, that's a sad reality of things. Uh, as I said just now, there are too much emphasis on technicalities instead of, uh, of uh, the justice of the matter. And the earlier, the better we move from this kind of mindset. You know? uh, if we are stuck to that mindset, uh, I don't know what will happen to our society. As uh, Dr. Mazatun said, Indonesia. Indonesia, you know why? Because uh, the NGOs are very powerful. For example, like the, uh, <coughs> like uh, I think, uh, the, the native NGO, the Alam or something, uh, they send, I can't remember the full name of that community. They are very, very active here, yeah? even in the Philippines. They're very, very active. And the universities also are actually very, very active on, on, uh, on the environment. And they are quite prepared to go to court. And of course, in the Philippines, there are some lawyers who are also uh, die hard on the environment. Uh, this thing that we are missing in this country, uh, we don't have that zeal. Do it. Uh, when we were doing one case uh, quite recently, we challenged uh, somebody who tried to cut a mountain to keep ducks, you know, from the mountain so that they can produce ducks and uh, and let the fellows below there uh, drink uh, ducks dung. Yeah. So we we took a case. We took some uh, native fellows to sue, and finally we got the judgment. And now the duck farm has uh, closed down, and we have no more hill cutting. But the mountain has been cut and. Uh, Luckily, eh, luckily for the river, it has uh, now rehabilitated to some extent that there are now fishes in the, in the river. So this is what I mean. 
uh, unless you are really passionate about it, nothing, nothing goes, nothing will will, will succeed. Uh, <clears throat> how I wish uh, those uh, doing environmental laws in the UIA or your uh, other universities, yeah, come and do visit. I think in Sabah or Sarawak, you know, and see for yourself uh, how much deforestation done and how much harm the so-called uh, planting of oil palm done to the environment. I've seen it, yeah, and uh, it's very sad. Uh, money may be to the tau case, lah, big money, uh, but uh, to leaves uh, and the animals, uh, it's very sad. It's a very sad story. And that's why even the elephants nowadays, they go to the villages. You, you know why? Because the habitat is being attacked. Now, you disturb my habitat, of course I come after you. Is it not? And I was just talking to a few fellas, gardeners, they were. They said they keep on complaining that they cannot get their durians and their fruits and all these things uh, because the monkeys and whatever come. Why not? Because there are no more fruits in the jungle. There's no jungle to, to get food. So they have to go to the, to the one that's been cultivated. So you see or not, we are paying for the price. That is the problem. And uh, just last week, or uh, three days ago, four days ago, we had a very, very bad flood in 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 in, in Kota Kinabalu and uh, surrounding areas. Very, very bad. First, uh, for the first time in my life, I've seen such a huge flood, you know, right up to the neck. And it's like a tsunami. You know why? They put so much emphasis on growing rubber trees, rubber plant, planting. And they cut the hills and they plant rubber. Now, rubber, has no tap root, you know, it has very shallow roots and they cannot control the soil. So when the rain came, you had mud sli uh, slides yeah? and nobody's business. Because there's nothing more for to hold the water in a mountain. Uh, these are the prices that we are paying today. These are the prices we are paying today. So I hope that, I hope so that those these guys will, will be aware of the environment, you know, the grid must be checked. To me, the whole problem in our community is greed, greed, money, you know? greed. Never mind about the small time, they want money. And I don't know whether we can ever instill this to our younger generation. I just hope so. Lah. I just hope so. Yeah? And uh, hopefully that, uh, if, I think if there are more court cases coming up, uh, people will wake up. But as I said, we really need to move on this locus to that issue. We really need to, I think there's an urgency on that issue. And uh, so that is the uh, uh, short story lifespan of that uh, Tuna Arifin's idea on environmental rules. Uh, I, was, I was a chairman of it and I thought I, I saw it growing, but uh, obviously it was, I don't know, <laughs> destroyed at, uh, at its infancy maybe, I don't know, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Tasri. I believe um, it's worth if we take one last question uh, from Shantini from WWF Nisha. I believe this question is for Dr. Mai Zatun. Good afternoon. Thank you for the presentations. My question is simple. How can we make environmental law and knowledge of environmental rights more accessible to the people and public? Could legal aid be extended to cover environmental cases? Where and how can people find out what their environmental rights are. Um, thank you so much for the question. I think there are two parts of the questions. One is about environmental education. Another one is about um, legal aid okay, to the public. And uh, well, uh, in, in relation to environmental education, a um, few weeks ago, um, I was presented on the topic of environmental education, actually, uh, with the with Panorlin, the Director General of the Department of Environment, she she just uh, uh, um, um, well, um, anyway, um, for for the purpose of that uh, presentation, I looked through uh, the syllabus for the primary school, uh, secondary school, and of course at the university level, I'm. And then I also get in touch with my friend who is a school teacher, uh, primary school, standard six, teaching science uh, at a school in Kedah. And the school, um, uh, majority of the pupils there are from um, fishing villagers in Kedah. 
um, so I was so surprised that, you know, when my, when that particular teacher with my friend, she shared a lot of activities, um, environmental activities based on the subject of science um, on her Facebook. So all these students, because of PKB, they, they would um, do all their presentation online. And I'm amazed to see all these 12 years old. They are so good at using technologies, TikTok and so on in their presentation, in their experiment. And um, there are a few uh, pictures where uh, activities involve parents and siblings. So I asked my friend, how come you let parents and siblings join in? So according to my friend, there are certain elements in science and environment which require the participation of parents together with children in relation to the environment. So I was, I feel that, wow, wow this is so amazing. It never happened during my time before. Okay, at the secondary school, for example, I look at one syllabus, there is one very good the subject known as um, Asas Kelestarian. I, 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 I went through the syllabus. It, it talks about, you know, uh, green technology, sustainability, and so on. Again, I'm very impressed with that syllabus because I myself don't have that much knowledge on that. Okay, of course, at the university level, Tansi already mentioned that environmental law is just an optional paper. It's not a compulsory paper, but for environmental law, I think anywhere, uh, not only for my uh, faculty, but also at other universities, uh, we do a hands-on type of teaching whereby we don't only give lecture, but during the non-face-to-face -face type of, you know, um, situations, uh, we will go to the ground. Okay, we will meet up. Uh, one of the requirements for my students uh, is for them to meet up with the local society around the campus uh, to provide for, I would say, a two-way type of engagement. Uh, first, uh, my student would try to find a, a kampong, for example, with certain environmental issues such as uh, river pollution and so on, and to provide for their, you know, um, their, their suggestions and whatever. But uh, I, I require them to do like a two-way type of engagement because I, I believe that even students like environmental law students or future future lawyers, they also need to learn from the society. Yeah, the, the some of the orang kampung they have their own traditional knowledge. Yeah, in in the in nearby the UAE campus, there are some um, orang asli villages. So I require my law student to learn from the orang asli of how do they manage the environment traditionally. Because if we don't tap on the knowledge of the orang asli. Yeah, it will be gone forever. Of course, we have already a law that need to safeguard this, you know, uh, this this knowledge uh, because we have seen already in certain countries like the United uh, United States, for example, where they have like uh what what the term we call it um uh, uh pirate what is the term mm. uh, uh, uh bio piracy something like that where where they they, they actually stole. You know, the, the, the knowledge of the local people, the products from the forest in Amazon, for example, and to, to patent it to be theirs. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, the next part of the question uh, with regard to um, helps, legal help no, that can be provided to the society on their rights. Okay, uh, at the UNC levels, uh, at least for IIUM, we have uh, what we call um, legal aid service, where we provide free service in all type of law, where the public can come and um, and uh, you know can consult uh, the relevant experts, uh, which made of uh, lecturers on all issues, not only environmental issues, uh, on land law, on, on banking, and so on and so forth. I believe some other universities might also be providing this. I think University of Malaya also, but I, I'm not sure about that. But for IIUM, yes, we have that. Uh, you can get in touch, uh, you know, um, uh, with um, the person in charge, and we will um, provide the necessary uh, advice to you. Okay, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zatun. In the interest of time, I think we are unable to take any more questions. Thank you to all attendees who have asked very interesting questions to our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the forum today. Thank you, Tan Sri Richard Malanjung. Thank you, Professor Dr. Zatun, And also to all those who were listening so instantly during the session. We are truly, truly honored to have the opportunity to listen to two very distinguished speakers. We pray that one day 
We hope we can meet each other physically. I will pass the floor back to the MC, Ilham Hafiz. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Ashraf, and to our speakers for the insightful session just now. Ladies and gentlemen, this event would not happen without the immense support from our organizers. With that in mind, it is with great pleasure that I invite Professor Farid Sufyan Shuaib, Dean of the Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Laws, International Islamic University, Malaysia, to give his speech. The floor is yours, Prof. Farid. Thank you, Brother Ilham Hafiz. Right Honorable Tan Sri Datuk Sri Panglima Richard Mananjun, who was Chief Justice of Malaysia. Dr. Brandon Kiso, Sastri for WWF Malaysia. Dr. Professor Dr. Mazat Mustafa from Ahmad Ibrahim Kuli of Laws, the National Islamic University of Malaysia. Madam Miza Muhammad, Director of the IUM World Debate and Oratory Center. Representative from WWF Malaysia, representative from Sabah Law Society, representative from the Malaysian Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights, the participants of the National Intervarsity Mock Trial Competition, and to all the viewers. Uh, IUM is happy to co organize the National Intervarsity Mock Trial Competition 2021 with uh, WWF Malaysia and Sabah Law Society in collaboration with the Malaysian Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights. This program is in line with the United Nations Ninth Sustainable Development Goal, specifically target 9.1, which is to develop sustainable, resilient, and inclusive infrastructure. And the UN 16th Sustainable Development Goal specifically target 16.3, which is to promote the rule of law and to ensure equal access to justice. This program is aimed to educate and to create awareness among UC students, and consequently, the public on issues related to the impact from unsustainable infrastructures and development through legal advocacy. It also focuses on enabling public action through the initiation of public interest cases by pairing the legal fraternity with, with this mock trial competition. The commitment of IUM in contributing to the cause of developing sustainable infrastructure could be seen in IUM winning the Sustainability Institution of the Year at the International Green Down Awards in 2020. IUM's involvement in this competition strengthened our efforts to advocate for more sustainable infrastructure and development that can be realized by the younger generation. The involvement of IWON uh, in this competition is also is a, the product of the institution commitment to promote public speaking on different platforms. The competition gives a voice to undergraduates across Malaysia to address real issues surrounding them. It also picks the participants' interest in different ways one can go about solving environmental issues that the world, especially Malaysia, is facing. The UC's commitment to promote public speaking is spearheaded by the IUM World Debate and Oratory Center, or more commonly known as IWON. And we can see that the center has produced many individuals with excellent oratory skills that should contribute in the advocacy of environmental issues. It is hoped that the collaboration between various agencies, as we see today between WWF Malaysia, IUM, the bar, and the bench, acts as a catalyst for more positive and sustainable changes to happen in our society. This type of synergy is pertinent in achieving the desired sustainable development goals, and we invite more parties to join us in realizing this. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Farid, for the insightful speech. Next, it is with great honor that I invite Datuk Brandon Keith Soh, 
the trustee of WWF Malaysia to deliver the launching speech of the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition 2021. Dr. Brendan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, MC. Allow me to recognize our distinguished guests, the Right Honorable Tan Sri Dr. Sri Panglima uh, Rich Malanjum, the former Chief Justice of Malaysia, Professor Farid Sufian Shuaib, Dean of the Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Laws, on behalf of Professor Emeritus Tan Sri Dr. Zukifli Abdul Razak, IIUM, uh, my, my friend, the Associate Professor, Dr. Maizatun Mustafa, an eminent environmental law lecturer of IIUM, Madam Mizan Muhammad, the Director of IIUM World Debate and Oratory Center, our committed CEO, Sophia Lim, and Conservation Director, Henry Chan of WWF Malaysia, representatives from IIUM, President Roger Chin of the Sabah Law Society, CEO Ferdaus Husni of the Malaysian Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights, participants of the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition, and all viewers who are watching live on YouTube. A very good afternoon, and thank you for being with us virtually today. As we all know, infrastructure development contributes to socioeconomic growth. However, poor design and location choices can lead to an unsustainable environment in the long run. In line with the Sustainable Development Goals, Target 9.1, which is to develop sustainable, resilient, and inclusive infrastructures, as well as Target 16.3, promotes the rule of law and ensure equal access to justice, WWF Malaysia advocates for elements of biodiversity to be considered and included in development right from the planning stage. This ensures a win-win situation for people, the environment, and the economy. The WWF Malaysia Strategy 2030 is committed to work on advocacy to integrate the principles of sustainability in the infrastructure and development plans moving forward. It is Indeed, an honor to work together with the International Islamic University of Malaysia, who are not only committed to promoting sustainable principles, but as mentioned earlier, have in fact won the International Green Gown Award for the 2020 Best Sustainable Institution category. We are very excited to host this inaugural InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition with the theme being sustainability in the form of legal advocacy. We are extremely grateful to our co-organizers for doing this with us. A big thank you to IIUM, Sabah Law Society, and the Malaysian Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights. We certainly hope that this competition will be a platform to discuss and promote sustainable infrastructure, focusing on the possibility of public action through, through the initiation of public interest cases, as mentioned earlier, and additionally, we hope that it would foster a bond between the legal fraternities from the different higher institutions in Malaysia. We trust that this experience would equip students with practical knowledge that can be used in their future careers, as well as perhaps be a springboard for our collective efforts to champion sustainable development in our nation. I hope everyone will enjoy and learn about infrastructure sustainability and development from today's event as well as over the next four months of the competition rounds. We will see you again at the grand finals next year. On this note, on behalf of WWF Malaysia and our organizing partners, I am truly honored to officially launch the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition 2021. Thank you.
Thank you, Datuk Brandon, for the for the wonderful speech. There are certainly great points made by him to be deliberated on by all of us. We also hope everyone enjoyed the multimedia presentation for the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition is hereby officially launched. Thank you to the speakers and panelists for your presence and insights shared, uh, shared with us today. It is truly an honor to host such notable and distinguished individuals today. Ladies and gentlemen, the next and final agenda, the release of the matchups and the first case scenario will begin momentarily. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Now, let us move on to our final agenda for today, the matchups and the release of the first case scenario. The floor now invites Mr. Roger Chin Kenfong, President of Sabah Law Society. Mr. Roger, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, for uh, Mr. MC, um, for inviting me to take care of this session, which I'd like to think is um, the highlight of the whole forum. Uh, uh, we're now going to the drawing the team session. And uh, first and foremost, um, the Right Honorable Dan Sri Datu Sri Malima Richard Malanjun, uh, former Chief Justice of Malaysia, um, Datu Brenton Kiso. Uh, trustee for WWF Malaysia, um, Professor Farid Sufyan, Dean of the Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Laws, um, Associate Professor Dr. Maizatun Mustafa, Environmental Law Lecturer, um, Madam Mizan Muhammad, Director of IIUM World Debate and Oratory Center, um, CEO Sophia Lim and Conservation Director Henry Chen of uh, WWF Malaysia, representatives from the Islamic International Islamic University of Malaysia, uh, representatives from SLS, uh, representatives from the Malaysian Center for Constitutionalism and Human Rights, our good friend, MCCHR, um, participants of the National InterVarsity Mock Trial Competition, and to all viewers watching live uh, from YouTube and Facebook. Um, as, uh, as, as the MC has said, I am Roger and the president of the Sabah Law Society. And we are now going to be drawing lots to determine the groups and placements of the teams in their respective uh, groups. And I will be doing this with uh, Dr. Brendan. So let me first start by explaining a little bit about how we're going to be doing this. We have 10 teams and uh, can we show the list of the teams, please? please? Okay, there are there will be a list of uh, the ten teams very soon. And what is the highlight of the whole event, I'm sure, is um, there will be ten ping pong balls in a ball which, uh, yes, here's the list, where Dr. Brandon is, ah, there, there's a ball there, yes, um, with, with cute little pandas there, and inside are 10 ping pong balls. And in these, and these ping pong balls basically have got, are labeled A1 to A5 and B1 to B5. So A1 would refer to team one in group A, A2 refers to team two in group A, and so on. As I read out the names of the institution, Dr. Brendan will pull out a random ping pong ball 
from his, from this ball, and we will repeat this process until all the teams have been assigned into a group and a number and a number. So without wasting any more time, um, let's start by doing that. And thank you so much, Brendan, uh, for, for uh, agreeing to do this. This certainly is a highlight to see Dr. Brendan so as the ping pong girl, as I called him that, um, because as we all know, in every uh, World Cup uh, and every draw, there's always somebody who will be picking, and it's always somebody who uh, um, is, is someone that wants to see. So, okay. Um, Taylor University team number one. Okay, Taylor's University team number one. You are now in group, group four and you are team number four. B4. Taylor's, yes, B4. Taylor's University team number two. B1. Okay. Taylor's University team number two, you are in group B, team number one. One, oh, sorry, what, what team was that? B1. Ah, B1, good, thank you. Okay, um, ATC. A5. ATC, you are in group A and team number five. UITM. A2. UITM, you are in group A and team number two. UNISA. B5. You are group B and team number five. IIUM. B2. Group B and team number two. And from Sabah, uh, UMS. A1. Ah, group A, team number one. USIM. B3. Group B, team number three. UITM2. A4. You are in group A, team number four. And last but not least, MMU. A3. Group A and team number three. Thank you, Dr. Brandon. Welcome. Okay, uh, with that, these teams will now be randomly, uh, so, sorry, the teams will now be matched up by a computer system. And that will be shown to teams very shortly. So let me just confirm who is in group A and in group B. Um, can we show that list please? Okay, so in group A, we have UMS, team number one, UITM, team number two, MMU, team number three, UITM, two, team number four, ATC, team number five. And in group B, we have Taylor's, team number two, we have IIUM as team number two in group B, USIM, team number three in group B, Taylor's Uni team one as team number four in group B, UNISA team number five in group B. Uh, earlier on, we have already matched up uh, these teams in a draw to make sure that everyone in the group stage will have two groups. And this will be shown to you very shortly. Um, whilst they're doing this, can I just maybe share a little bit about this mock trial competition? Um, we, SLS had started this competition, I think as early on as in 2007, 
And at that time, uh, we were doing it for schools in high schools in Kota Kinabalu. And uh, as the years went on, we eventually added on teams, high school teams in the whole of Malaysia, uh, in the whole of Sabah. Um, and that the last edition of that was in 2018. So between 20, 2007 to 2018, um, it wasn't held every year. There were long gaps where uh, it was not held. Um, however, um, there is a tradition in the Sabah bar where what we do have is a welcome to the bar and, and the new lawyers, newly called lawyers would come and tell um, the seniors who are there uh, introducing themselves about what made them or inspired them to be lawyers. And what was very interesting is that actually um, a great many of these students said that it was the mock trial competition that actually inspired them uh, to be lawyers. Um, they took part in the competitions, whether it was in 2007 and the various editions that were done. And uh, because of what they went through, um, they eventually did become lawyers. And this is the reason why um, SLS is very passionate about this mock trial competition. Um, and we have put in a lot of great time and effort into making this into what it is today. So when WWF approached um, SLS and wanted to do this, um, it was a very natural fit to take part in this. And finally, um, we have gotten to what we had always hoped um, to make a mock trial competition into a national event. Um, and of course, um, Dan Sri Richard Malanjun, he was very modest, uh, but this one million trees um, that he was talking about under the, 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 courts, uh, the court program was actually um, under his watch as a CJSS. And um, Dr. Brendan will attest to him uh, planting many trees all throughout Sabah. Um, and uh, during his time as the president of uh, SLS, and uh, I have had the chance to look at some of these trees um, on some of the visits back. And uh, good to tell you, Dr. Brendan, some of them are still alive and still standing. They're not very big, but they're still there. And um, can I ask whether or not the, the, the list is ready for showing the matchups? I'm told another one minute. Okay. And so this one million trees um, that, that Dun Street has been doing was followed up by um, Dun Street David Wong, which was the um, oceans, um, no, marine conservation. Okay, the, the list is going up. Soon. So this is the final matchup for the three rounds in the National Mock Trial Competition 2021. Teams, please do take note of when you are competing and whether or not you are a prosecution plaintiff or defense or, uh, or, 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 def or uh, defendant or plaintiffs in the rounds. Sorry, this doesn't quite show what you are, but regardless, what will happen is um, you will all be receiving your case notes very soon. And when you get your case notes, it will tell you what you are. So if you receive um, a plaintiff's case note, then you are the plaintiff. If you receive a defense uh, a case note, then you are a defense, you are playing the defendant. Uh, likewise, if you receive a prosecution, you are prosecution. And if you receive um, a defense, you are the defense. So before I finally um, uh, finish off, I'd like to take this opportunity to also um, thank the uh, case scenario writers. Um, in the case scenario writers, we had a very able team, uh, which included uh, myself, which I had to chair, uh, Duan Aizuddin, special officer from the special officer of uh, Chief Judge of Sabah Sarawak, Dr. Khadija um, Binti Mohammad Najid, who is an academician from IIUM, um, Juan Sharija, 
who is an um, academic from UMS, University of Malaysia Sabah, and Ms. Shantini Gunarajan, the Marine Policy Manager from WWF Malaysia. They have spent the past two months in putting together the questions. And I am certain when the groups, um, the teams get their questions, they will realize just how much effort has gone into doing this. And I am eternally grateful um, to this case scenario writers to have come up with this. Um, there's much more work to be done, but rest assured, um, they will get all the other questions out. Um, but at the very least, we have the first two questions which are ready with the first one already going to be launched very, very soon. Um, and the reason why we had this committee was very simple. What we wanted to do was to make sure that um, the, the, the questions were beyond reproach. They were prepared by people not involved in the competition. Uh, they were prepared by, in fact, third parties um, who were not directly involved in the competition, organizing of the competition. And because of that, uh, parties, uh, uh, teams can rest assured that the questions uh, are very confidential. Uh, no one knows about the questions. They were arrived at without um, um, any favor to any particular side. And you can proceed with the competition knowing full well that it was independently arrived at. And uh, with that, um, I'd like to finish here and let the teams know um, the questions will now be emailed to all of you. So good luck in the competition. And I look forward to seeing all of you um, in the final round. Thank you very much. And I pass the floor now back to the MC. Thank you, Mr. Roger, for manning the release of the matchups and the case scenario for the first round of NMTC just now. For the participants' information, if you can see at your slides here, the left one, the first team will be the prosecution, and the second team on the matchup will be the defendant. That is applicable for all rooms and all groups. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of our event. We look forward to seeing everyone during the first round of the NMTC 2021, which will be held on 23rd of October 2021. It will also be streamed live on YouTube. We would also like to give a gentle reminder to all participants to follow our Facebook and Instagram page at NMTC 2021 underscore. Once again, thank you for gracing our launching ceremony with your presence. See all of you then. Till then, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and have a good day.